building program going on in heaven. Construction carried out by God's own hand. Fifteen hundred miles wide, the mansions standing side by side. The streets are paved with gold throughout the land. Now they say there'll be no dying in that city. No sickness and no sorrow will be known. The people will be young, no division, all but one. Eternal celebration going on. Don't you want to go? see you all today. My name is Scott. I'm the family pastor. Welcome. Uh, if you're here with us in person or online, welcome. Glad that you're here today. We have a lot of folks right now in the discovery class. It's been going on since 930 this morning, learning more about First Baptist. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist and you're not a member, we encourage you to plug into our discovery class. We'll have another one coming up uh, in the next few weeks, so be sure you let us know that you want to do that. If you are here today, raise your hand. All right, good, good. You may put your hands down and make sure you're paying attention. I am glad that you are here. A couple of really quick, important announcements to bring your attention to that are in the bulletin today in our worship folder. And that is Vacation Bible School. 
Uh, we would love for you, your grandchildren, your nieces or nephews to participate in Vacation Bible School. To do that, you can just text the word VBS to that number right there. It's also in your worship folder, 704-1577. Text VBS to that number. You'll get a text right back, and you, it'll send you some links. If you want to volunteer for VBS, that's the same way. Text VBS. We need a lot more volunteers. We have not even started promoting this to the community yet. Okay, we're going to start doing that in the ne this week probably, but we already have about 50 kids signed up for VBS without even announcing it outside of our church. So that's really great. Uh, so we want you to be sure to uh, get on board quickly with that. Help us out. We need your help. I have a place for you no matter what you do, okay? I have a place for you, all right? You got it? Got it? You can help. We would love for you to help. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. If you're a guest with us today, in front of you in the pew, there is a welcome card. We would love for you to fill that out. Or you can text the word welcome to that same number, 352-704-1577. Uh, We'd love for you to do that. Just tell, text welcome to that. We'll know that you're here that way. We can pray for you. We can lift you up in our prayer time during the week as staff. Thank you so much for being here today. Are you ready to worship? Yeah. Some of you, I think, would rather be in bed. Are you ready to worship? Yes. We are glad that you're here today. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, continue our worship time with Pastor Aaron and our awesome choir. By the way, Pastor Aaron, you have an excellent drummer. I just want to say, drummer, <laughs> excellent drummer. That's my son. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, us to be able to come and just stop and get out of our regular routine of weekly um, work, weekly um, perhaps even chaos, uh, weekly family, just to come and stop and worship you today. Help us lay it all at your feet. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this church that we can come and learn and grow each week. Thank you for our choir. Thank you for Pastor Aaron. Be with us today as we worship. Be with Pastor as he brings the message today. In your name, all God's people said, amen. Pastor. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed.
Billy's going to lead us on this song here. Good, good fun.
Jesus, we give you all the honor and glory and praise. Glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify your name in this worship service. Glorify your name in our prayer life. Glorify your name in our daily lives. Glorify your name throughout our family, Lord. Glorify your name in your church, even this hour. May Jesus, you, be glorified and lifted up. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would change us, touch our hearts, speak to us, Lord, that we might know you and know you intimately. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Oh, church, it's such a blessing to be with you today. I was uh, just over at our family ministry center, and I was saying to them, welcome home. So welcome home to each and every one of you. We have our largest discovery class that we have had going on since before 2020 with uh, the pandemic. And so uh, approximately 50 people are over in our family ministry center. And so that's a wonderful blessing. So if you're wondering why does it look a little sparse in here, well, that would have been 50 people that would have been in here worshiping with us. But uh, to tell you that to take in 50 new members at once, you need to know that's like what, uh, that's the size of more than 50% of the churches in the United States. And so that we would be so blessed, uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, our ladies had a women's uh, time of worship, Women in the Word, on Friday night in here. If you notice all the baby soap that's out there, all that, that was all collected for the local pregnancy center for life's choices through the women's event on Friday night. And so uh, I've heard that it was a wonderful time as the speaker talked about being beautifully broken. And I've had a number of ladies comment that they so enjoyed it and it was such a great time. We're doing all we can to follow up from our Easter services as we had over 800 in attendance last week and so we had the women's event on Friday night. Now we have the discovery class today. Men, you will have a men's event this Thursday night with a meal over in our family ministry center. And uh, Wednesday night, we'll have our regularly scheduled business meeting so that we can vote on all of these new, new members. That'll be Wednesday night also over in the family ministry center. So the Lord is blessing and doing some incredible, incredible things. Well, I preached for four weeks on the journey with Jesus from Jericho to Jerusalem, from uh, him being able to share literally with Zacchaeus all the way to the cross and the resurrection. And today I'm going back to the series that I began in January on the stories of the Bible, the famous stories of the Bible. What I'm discovering is, unfortunately, after 15 years of ministry, I thought I have referenced all of these stories many times. Unfortunately, I've realized I have not preached from them. And shame on me. I can't believe I hadn't. So today is perhaps the most famous of all Bible stories other than the resurrection of Jesus. This is one of those stories that everybody knows, that even lost people know. In, by the way, I was going around the room just asking people their name, denominational background, and what state they were born in. And in just a few moments that I had with our new members, two had come from atheist backgrounds and no church background whatsoever. And God had saved them in miraculous ways and done incredible things. And literally, we're taking in, I, I've always said our church is like pastoring a circus. So if you love the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, we have it all here. So literally, uh, over 40 different denominational backgrounds. So several people were from Lutheran backgrounds and several people were from, well, a ton from Catholic backgrounds. And then, we just to add the spice of life, we had several Pentecostals who will shout along with us and say hallelujah. And so <laughs> it was just so much fun because if you, if you don't understand different denominational backgrounds, it's just beautiful to see, you know, I mean, uh, highly intellectual Presbyterians and Lutherans who, who don't get excited about much. And, 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 but they're here, and we love them. We love them, and we love them so much. And then it goes from those who are afraid to move in church 
and certainly afraid to clap all the way to the Pentecostals and, and that's who God gives us everybody in the community it's just amazing what God does here so this incredible famous Bible account of what God did other than the resurrection anybody want to guess what's the number one story other than the resurrection what? No, not loaves and fishes. Old Testament. I'll help you. Old Testament. Parting of the Red Sea, Daniel and the lion's den, it's none of those. It's the flood of Noah. <laughs> so that's where I'm at today. Genesis chapter 6, the flood of Noah. Okay, that's where we're going to be. So go ahead and turn today uh, in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 6. It is the account where God destroys all life, all life. Uh, everything that has the breath of life in it, the Bible says, he destroys, and that is found in Genesis chapter 6. I'll begin in verse 5. Let's all stand in honor of God's word. Genesis 6, beginning in verse 5, and uh, it, it's just such a powerful account. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and here it is, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Folks, that's bad. Everything was bad. Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Key verse, verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace is such an important word. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Another key phrase, he walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, so bless you so God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth verse 13 and God said to Noah the end of all flesh has come before me the earth is filled with violence through them and behold I will destroy them with the earth make yourself an ark of gopher wood make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch this is how you shall make it the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits and you shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side you shall make it with lower second and third decks and behold I myself will bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything, everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you they shall be male and female of the birds after their kind of animals after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind two of every kind now you need to know a kind is not the same as a species polar bears and grizzly bears will interbreed and have offspring so it's not saying two polar bears and two grizzly bears. It's two bears. It's not two Dalmatians and two German shepherds and two, the list goes, not two Dotson, no, two dogs. Just two dogs. It's not, so you get the idea when you do a kind as opposed to a species. And you shall take for yourself, verse 21, of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. That's a key verse. May God's word not come back void. You may be seated. 
I have a brief video to show you how large the ark really was. Since the Ark Encounter opened in 2016, millions of people from around the world and from different faith traditions have visited this life-size replica of Noah's Ark. Many are aware of the account of Noah through reading the Bible, a children's book, or even in pop culture. But what you may not know is the Ark symbolizes the life and work of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Noah's day that the inclinations of man's heart were only evil all the time. Since Adam and Eve, that's been the reality for humanity. The world was extremely violent. It was exceedingly bad. And the Lord decided that he was going to send a flood to judge that sin. God is a God of grace and mercy. And in judgment, he always brings salvation. Noah and his family were different in that they were trusting God. They weren't perfect, but they were seeking after him and trusting him. And by trusting him, God provided for them. He provides an ark of salvation. Through Noah and his three sons, the human race was saved. And through his son Shem came the line leading to Jesus. Jesus' time in ministry, we see that the culture was similar to that in the days of Noah. Broken by sin, people focused on self rather than God. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. He was warning people of that day that as people rebel against God, it's a warning, judgment will come as it did in the days of Noah. Jesus offers himself as a lifeline. Jesus describes himself as the door. So as you walk on the second deck, you'll come to that great door, one door. As people come to that door, they might not see it at first, but there's actually a cross illuminated on that door. So you think back to Noah's day, there was one way to be saved going through the door of Noah's ark. And that makes people think about Jesus and they think about the message of salvation. When you walk around the ark encounter, you may be surprised to realize other parallels between Noah and Jesus. Noah was a carpenter. He built an incredible ark out of wood. Do you realize that Jesus was also a carpenter? He was trained from Joseph, his father. Just as Noah came out of the ark, God's provision of salvation for him, Jesus came out of the tomb providing salvation for us. So Noah released a dove and the dove came back with a leaf in its mouth and that leaf represents new life after the flood. And of course that's a picture of the fact that salvation in Christ leads to new life in Christ. Well, I wanted you to see how large that is. That big boat, which is just a replica, of course, is not the largest wood structure in Kentucky. It's not even the largest wood structure in the United States. It's actually the largest wooden structure in all of North America. That begins to put it in context for you how big the ark was that God told Noah to build. It was absolutely a monster size. And one of the things that has helped me through the years is in my children's books as a child, it shows two big two-ton elephants walking up to the ark. The problem with that is you've cut a lot of their reproduction years, and it's a lot to handle, and it's a lot to feed. But if you take two little baby elephants, two little baby elephants that have time to grow over a year in the ark, then you lengthen their reproductive years once you're off the ark, and it allows for there to still be elephants today. It's one of those things, if you begin to think through, you don't need to take the two 19-foot crocodiles. They have big teeth. You can take the little 12-inch crocodile, and then it's really easy to feed on the ark. So, you know, it just takes some time to think through all of those. Lions can be pretty dangerous, but when they're cuddly little fur balls, when, when, you first, when, they're, when they're first born, you know, I mean, why take the monster that's 13 years old when you can just take one that's young, that's a little one, and you have to think they need to be able to reproduce afterwards. And so it's one of those wonderful things that you begin to realize oh that's how they did it but my children's storybook didn't show that picture 
My little children's storybook showed big animals getting on the ark. I mean, they were giraffes that were 20 feet tall, and that's not necessary for the ark. You understand you could take little animals. Then it all begins to make sense. See, the story of Noah is about so much more than old animals or cute little fuzzy animals or people even. It's about so much more than all of that. It's a story of salvation, a story of provision, a story of protection and warning and of judgment. It is so well known that people who are not Christians will still know this particular story. See, today, most scientists that have a brain, regardless of their religious background and their academic training, recognize and acknowledge that there was a worldwide flood at some point in Earth's history. So the fact that there was a flood by most scholars is not up for debate or question. That's been accepted today. How else could you discover fish fossils at the tops of all the mountain ranges of the entire world if there hadn't been a flood? So the flood happened. I believe the Bible and the evidence is overwhelming for those who are willing to look at the facts honestly. So the problem for skeptics is not the flood. The problem is with Noah. And too many specifics. They really struggle with the Bible. See, if a doubting person can acknowledge the flood, then where's the problem? The problem is with how the Bible lays it out. We are told who. We are told how long. We are even told why there is a flood. We are told how long the flood lasts, and that is a lot of information for someone who is skeptical. So then they become even more dissatisfied and distraught because they cannot accept that another person's actions could cause so many people harm. What is that in reality? In reality, it is the idea of responsibility and accountability. People always want to avoid accountability. Specifically, skeptics struggle with how people's sinful actions, how their acts of violence could cause such catastrophe. Now, we have many examples in the 20th century of how one person's sinful actions has caused millions of people to die and suffer. I name one name to you, Hitler. And people ought to realize one person can cause catastrophe and cause millions of deaths. If you total in all the battle deaths of all the nations of the world, from India and China and Japan and Germany and the United States, and you go all around the world, well over 100 million people died in World War II. Well over that. And it was all instigated by one little crazy man who literally hated the Jews. Uh, now, by that one example, you would think that someone who is a skeptic or a doubter would begin to connect the dots and say, okay, sinful actions can cause catastrophe. You, you would think, because there's way more than one example in history, I just named one that we actually have video of. So you would think that people would say, okay, we can connect all those dots, and maybe sinful actions can cause cat catastrophe. But no, no. That means that there has to be accountability and responsibility. And all people want to avoid those things. We all want to avoid accountability, especially someone who is skeptical. So because no person wants to be held accountable for their actions, the one question that is not answered becomes what the skeptic focuses on in the Genesis account of the flood. What is the one question that they would say is not answered? It actually is answered, but they would say it's not. It is this. Because we have who, what, when, where, why. Okay, the one question that's not answered is when. 
when. When did all this occur? Because it is not answered to their satisfaction. Then the entire story is worthless in their mind and debunked. Actually, Genesis 7-11. Y'all remember 7-11? That ought to be easy to remember. Everybody needs to run to 7-11. Here we go. No, I do not own stock in that company. Verse 11 says this. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, in Scripture, 40 is always enough. 40 is enough. You say, what are you talking about? Well, it rained for 40 days and nights. And how long did, after Jesus rose from the dead did he walk on earth? 40 days before the ascension into heaven. 40 is just enough in the Bible. It's enough of it. <laughs> so 40 days of rain, that's enough. And so uh, that's all extra. That wasn't in the notes. Just thought you ought to know. So the actual problem with the skeptic is the when because there's, they are unable to put Noah's life and the second month and the 17th day into our modern calendar. And they really struggle. When did this occur? When did it happen? There's simply insufficient evidence to reconcile it with our current calendar. And so they say, well, then the account cannot be true. Today, my goal is not to prove to you the biblical account, although I started that way. It's not even to prove to you that there was a flood. I want to show you some biblical truths from this story of Noah, from this biblical, biblical account that you can af apply to your life and to your family's life from the Bible. One of the greatest verses in the account of Noah that I underlined years ago is Genesis 6-8. Go ahead and look at Genesis 6-8. It's absolutely amazing. It's very brief, and here's what it says. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace. What is grace? Grace is favor. Favor. It means God is for Noah. God is for us when we've experienced his grace. Having God's favor is not God doing favors for you. <laughs> That's not what it means. It doesn't mean God does you favors. It doesn't mean that you don't have trials. It doesn't mean that you won't go through difficulties. It doesn't mean that life is always easy. No, having God's favor means that there was something about Noah's life that made God smile. Something about his life that just made God smile. This weekend, we had, a, a, you know, I'm living the, the dream right now, and my kids are... The first one is finally going to graduate. And I've never experienced any of this. And those of you who've lived through it, for your kids to graduate and actually get to the point in life where, like, you don't pay for them anymore, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's major success. You know, I mean, where, like, they take care of their own bills and, and they're living life and making making decisions that hopefully are good decisions and some of you've seen your kids do that and some of you have seen your kids not do that and we're just you know at graduation time you just hold your breath and hope lord we've done the best we know how you know every parent makes mistakes and you just hope that you've done the best you can do and uh so they had awards on friday and ethan and ellie both got a, a gold honor roll which means that they had a 4.0 or better and I, I was just proud papa and then ellie for uh is in graduating she became what's known as an ap scholar she will graduate high school with over a year of college already done uh from both ap classes and dual enrollment classes they didn't have those animals when i was growing up so, I mean, we had to go for four whole years, and that's just the way it was, you know. But I was just proud Papa, just proud Papa. And I just smiled and smiled and smiled. Last night was their prom. 
Friday night was Mount Dora's prom, Mount Dora High School. They had it at the Howie Mansion up at Howie in the Hills. I drove by the Howie Mansion during their, during their prom, and I just wanted to bust up in there so bad, and I just thought I would so embarrass Ethan Booz and Nate Humpston. I mean, it would just, their pastor showed up at prom. And I've done that before, but it wasn't for a nice reason, so I, I decided not to do that, you know. And, and then my girl had prom last night, and I was just proud papa. We took a thousand pictures, you know, and in the dread, I thought it was a wedding. Scared me to death. It just too many pictures, too much, too much. I was just, but just smiling. What do you do in your life that makes God smile? Let, let me ask you a, di- a different way. Have you ever prayed and asked for God's favor on your life? I know many of you have probably never even thought about it. You've never asked for God's favor because you've never even thought about that question. But something in Noah's life made God smile, and he had God's favor upon him. So here's what I'd like to do. I believe in applying the word of God immediately. So right where you are, would you bow your head and be willing to pray and say, Lord, I would like to experience your favor. Are you you willing to do that? Just right where you are, just pray and say, Lord, I want to experience your favor. I want the favor of God on my life. I want my life to do something that makes you smile, to be something that makes you smile. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that was a big prayer. And I didn't mean to lead you into a trap, I promise. But here's the truth. The Lord is the same yesterday and today and forever. So between you and the Lord, if something has to change to make God smile, it means it's on you. (laughs) It ain't on the Lord. The Lord doesn't need to do anything to change. He is perfect in all of his ways. We just sang that. The Lord's perfect in all of his ways. He doesn't need to change one thing. If anything needs to change for God to smile, it's on you. All of us have things in our lives that we need to change. Uh, There's no one perfect. and uh, Nobody's perfect. I I say that all the time. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I say all the time, Christians still sin. It's just the difference is we're forgiven. And so, so you know, it's one of those things that we all have to work through and ask the Lord to help us so that we can be the people that he wants us to be. Noah made God smile. Oh, I hope that we can. Remember, it's not God doing favors. It's our life that can make the Lord smile. Secondly, I want you to notice something. Noah and his family were saved the same way that we are. Again, it's based on this verse in in verse 6. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then again in verse um, uh, 9, it says, Noah walked with God. And so I, I just want you to know, Noah and his family, the same word is used for their salvation as it is for us, the word grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says it this way, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For by grace, grace you have been saved. It's all by grace. Noah was saved by grace because he didn't deserve it, and we are saved by grace. We experience God's favor when we are saved because the just died for the unjust. Jesus died in your place. He paid your price on the cross that you might be saved and experience God's favor so that your sins could be forgiven if by faith you trust in the Lord Jesus and repent of sin. See, the account of Noah lets all of us know that just as they were saved from the flood, we too are saved from the flood of judgment when we trust in Jesus Christ. We are saved from hell we're saved from those things by faith through grace so just as there was one door on the ark you heard on the video to come through still today there's only one way to be saved and that is through jesus christ and him alone 
There is no other way. God saved those who had faith, and still today, he saves those who have faith. The third thing I want you to notice, and it's not in this passage, but it is true, we learn it from the New Testament actually, is that Noah warned others. Noah warned others. What You say, what am I talking about? Well, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, we read this, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Well, if you're a preacher, guess what? You're saying something. You're saying something out loud. Now, I believe that building one of the largest structures that the world had ever, has ever known, certainly at that time, I believe that was a witness because he's working on it a hundred years. But we learn in the New Testament, he's not just working on the boat and saying nothing. He's working on the boat and saying something. He's a preacher of righteousness. Now, it's only been 10 generations since Adam. Of course, the generations are long. They all live to be over 900 years old. And so the generations are very, very long. And in that 10 generations, the people come to the place where they are so evil that it says the thoughts and the intents, every inclination of their heart was evil, all, only evil all the time. To tell you how bad that is, it makes Sodom and Gomorrah look like they're okay. I mean, everybody is all the time thinking of only wickedness. So when we realize how much our culture has shifted, let's say since 1990, boy, since 1990, our culture has shifted and moved exponentially toward the evil, exponentially. If you want to shorten it, since 2000, our culture has moved exponentially toward evil where literally we, we buy needles now for drug addicts so that they don't use dirty needles. I mean, that's, you understand that that's kind of crazy logic. We want to help them by giving them their drug paraphernalia. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. But the bottom line is we're still not as bad as what they were in Noah's day. Now, where will we be in another 30 years? The snowball is going down the mountain faster and faster. You understand? That's how, that's how it works. So is our culture before our eyes quickly unraveling? Yes. Anybody who, you can see how the culture is progressing. Where no longer is there any debate. People on each side call the other ones crazy things. Like, oh, you know, I mean, everything becomes a fight of the extremes. It's constantly like that. And, and that didn't used to be uh, how it was, but it is now. We see this happening. Listen, it happened in Noah's day, and Noah warned the people. He warned the people that there was a problem. It, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we read these words. It's Jesus' last week. I mean, literally, this is on Monday or Tuesday, at the latest Wednesday, and Thursday night is the Lord's Supper, and he's on the cross on Friday. So this is right before. Jesus quotes very few people in his last 72 hours of life. He doesn't mention a lot of other prophets, but he mentions one specifically several times in his last preaching time. And the one he mentions is the preacher of righteousness, Noah. I find that interesting right before his death and he says this beginning in Matthew 24 verse 36 but of that day and hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven but my father only but as the days of Noah were so also will be the coming of the son of man be for as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. 
Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. See, Noah warned, and the Lord warned still today those who have faith. Luke and Mark tell us of the second coming of Jesus Christ, that it'll be just like the days of Noah. In other words, there will be somebody preaching, but there won't be very many who will be listening. And so it's important to know those things. The fourth thing I want you to notice for this text of, uh, and what Noah did is this. The Lord provided for those who had faith. The Lord provided. Yes, Noah and the others had to build the ark, but the Lord told them the dimensions. He even told them what to coat it with, which was pitch. Now, we don't know the chemical makeup of what the pitch was, but it, it, it's one of those things that obviously sealed the boat from leaks. By the way, if you don't know this and you've never worked much with wood, when you put the beams together and you put them in water, do you all know what happens to wood when it's put in water? It expands. So it would also, by sitting in the water, it literally would stop the leak. But when you, it's just all extra. I just wanted to throw that out there. The Lord told them what to build it with, gopher wood. He told them how big it was to be, 30 cubits by 50 cubits by, by 30 cubits high, wide or high. Uh, let me go ahead and share with you the dimensions of the ark modern shipbuilders have recreated this in 3D simulations with computers. And here's one of the things they've realized, that when you build a ship that is weighted, it has to be weighted, in these dimensions, it is practically impossible to capsize it. You can't capsize it. It's absolutely amazing. God gave them the dimensions. They called the Titanic the unsinkable ship, and they built it with the wrong dimensions. But this ship, built with these dimensions, could take waves that would even be 80 and 100 feet high and not capsize. Absolutely amazing what God did by giving them these measurements. And then in verse 21, when I say the Lord provided boy did he and you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten and you shall gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and for them see the Lord provided for those on the ark he provided food and shelter transportation and protection he is the great provider so here's the question for you today what do you need for the Lord to provide in your life what do you need for the Lord to provide in your life? He is the great provider. I want you to know he provides for those who have faith. The greatest thing, if I had to whittle it all down, what's the greatest single thing that the Lord provides? It is this. The greatest thing that the Lord provides is salvation. That was true in Noah's day, and it is still true for you today. The greatest single thing that God provided Noah and his family was to be saved. That was the greatest need that they had, to be saved from the flood. I want you to know, the greatest need that you have today is to be saved, to be saved from the flood of judgment that is to come. It is the greatest gift to be saved, and it's true still for us today. He does provide. He provides salvation and so much more. He provided all that Noah needed, and he still provides the same. He will provide all you need, even when you don't know how it will all work out. Noah did not know how it was all going to work out, but he knew that the Lord would provide, and he provided for those who had faith. The fifth thing I want you to notice is this. Out of this text, the Lord protected those who had faith. Genesis 8.1 says this, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. God remembered. That could easily say God protected. I want you to know when God remembers you, you are protected. I don't know what you're dealing with in your life today. Most every one of us in the room are dealing with something. But if the Lord can protect Noah... For over a year, through a flood that no one else on earth survived, 
then I know that the Lord can protect you. He can protect you from the pains of your past. He can protect you from the wounds of the present. He can protect you from the fears of the future. He can protect you whether the economy is doing well or whether we're going into recession. The Lord can protect you from temptation. The Lord can protect you from hell. The Lord can protect you from eternal damnation. He can protect you from judgment just like he did Noah. He can protect you from Satan. He can protect you from evil. He can protect you from sin. He can protect you even from you. The Lord can protect you, and he does protect those who have faith. He did Noah, and he will you. The sixth thing I want you to notice about the passage concerning Noah is this. I want you to know that God's word is true. He told them about judgment from a flood, and it happened. Now, the flood is a great reminder that when God says he's going to do something, he does it. In chapter 6, verse 16, uh, 17, we read these words, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. When the Lord says it, it's as good as done. And some of you may say, well, the timing sure was off. And you would be right. In our minds, the timing is off. Because God said it, and how long did it take before, before there was a flood? It took another hundred years. A hundred years. God delayed after he said it. Well, if we looked at that in our lifetime, a hundred years, none of us are alive practically. Well, none of us, usually. There might be, no, there's not even a little baby in here. You know, there's one. Maybe the baby. And they better live a long time. By the, you know, a hundred years? So why did God delay after he said it? Why did he wait? He waited to be merciful so that some might be saved. That's why he waited. He waited so that some could be saved. Noah and his family. Still today, the Lord has spoken many promises, and yet we wait. Why do we wait? It is the same reason as it was in Noah's day. The Lord is waiting so that some might be saved. That's why he waits. That's why he tarries. In Matthew 25, we read these words. Again, Jesus' last week on earth, his last week of preaching, just 72 hours or so before the Garden of Gethsemane. And in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, we read these words from our Savior. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Some people think that Jesus has only been working on heaven since the resurrection. I want you to know God built all that you see and much that you didn't see in six days. Heaven, he's been working on it. This text says, not since the resurrection, since the foundation of the world. Listen, heaven's better than anything you can ever imagine. Since the foundation of the world. And then he says, why? For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. 
Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil's, uh, devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. God's word is true, just like it was in Noah's day. And we may not know the day or the hour. We may not know the timing. God certainly delays on his time schedule. But he does so so that more can be saved. And I want you to know it does not change what God will do. Lastly, the seventh thing I want you to notice from this passage is this. In Genesis chapter 6 through 9, we learn judgment is sure for those who disobey. Judgment is sure. There were millions of people in Noah's day. How many people do you think were on the earth? You, surely you believe it was more than 25,000. And most people would say even more than a million. Actually, scientists have done all kinds of studies, and here's what you can look at. If you take the average of them living to 900 years, and you start them having a child after, the, after they're 100 years, after they're 100 years old, and you start each one of those children having children after they're 100 years old. But they have children for only 500 years. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, you know, let's just say just 500 years. Then literally, the low estimates of the population of the world would have been 250 million. The low estimates. People having children, think of it. No cancer, no flu. No disease. People aren't dying until they're 900 years old unless they're murdered. And violence was everywhere. And that's where the world was. People who were living so long, having children, and you know, by the way, let's just go ahead and put it out there. You know people were having children out of wedlock. Don't think they were only having children with their spouse. Listen, every intent of their hearts and their thoughts were evil continually all the time. I mean, that's as bad as it gets. And that's where the people were in Noah's day. Judgment is sure. The point is not how many people were living. The point is that judgment is sure for everyone who disobeys. So if you're not saved, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, then you are in danger, for no one is promised tomorrow. No matter what your age, nobody's promised tomorrow. Revelation says it most clearly, what Jesus is going to do. In Revelation 20, beginning in verse 10, it says these words, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I want you to know, hell was not intended for you. Hell was not intended for any person. It was made for the devil and his demons. But then in verse 11, we read this. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, and whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books, plural, very important there, were opened. Everybody's name is in a book, some book. The question is, what book? And another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books, plural. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life, singular, was cast into the lake of fire. 
I want you to know that's not what God desires for you, but judgment is sure. It is going to happen. God has spoken. Judgment is going to happen for Satan and all of his demons. The verdict is already decided. Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. But the second inhabitants are of hell are also very clear from this passage. It is everyone who has rejected salvation through Jesus Christ. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? It is when you trust Jesus as your Savior. The moment you trust Jesus as your Savior and repent of your sin, your name is written in the book of life. It is not when you are baptized. It is not when your parents had you sprinkled. It is not when you are on the church rolls. There will be millions of people on church rolls across the world that won't be found in the book of life. When you commit your life to Jesus and say that you are following him, that's when your name is written in the book of life. You're trusting him, asking for forgiveness of your sins, and that you want to follow him the rest of your life. See, judgment is sure. God has decided. Today, would you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Right where you are, right, where, right now, right where you are, would you bow your head and just go into that mode of prayer? And would you ask the Lord, would you be willing to ask him, say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Would you ask him to cleanse your heart of all sin? Just say, forgive me, Lord. I am sorry. I've done things wrong. Say, Lord Jesus, please, I want to follow you. Have mercy on me. Teach me your ways. Change me so that I don't desire evil things, but I desire holy things, good things, things that are right. Just ask the Lord, Lord, please forgive me and save me. Take control of my life. Help me to have faith. I believe, help my unbelief. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead. I believe you're coming again, Lord Jesus. Please have mercy on me, a sinner. I want to follow you from this day forward. Others of you in the room, you need to rededicate your heart and your life to the Lord. You know that you're a believer, but the problem is you've strayed so far away. Would you ask the Lord to forgive you? Just say, Lord, forgive me. I do believe in you, but I know I've not been living for you. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant a willing spirit to sustain me. Others of you need to pray and ask the Lord to give you courage, strength, to step out by faith, to follow through with believer's baptism. You've never done that, and it's just time. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed of the Lord Jesus. Don't think it's something that you'll ever regret. That's not it. It's you saying, Lord, I'm going to follow your command. I'm going to follow through with baptism. Or joining the church. Some of you still need to join the church. You know that this is home for you. And today needs to be the day when you say, Lord, I'm, I'm home. Lord Jesus, I pray in this moment that for each person, each person, that you would lead and guide us and direct us in the decisions that we need to make. Because we know that the Bible is true and judgment is sure. And we in every way want to be right with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The 
greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy 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 and we cry holy 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 and we cry holy 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 is the lamb we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy, holy, holy and we cry holy, holy, holy and we cry holy, holy, holy Present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God be all glory and power, majesty and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Be blessed, church. I hope to see you Wednesday or men Thursday at the men's event.